Welcome to the show. Today, we are speaking with a human performance expert, someone who has run human performance for the US military for seven years and has worked with professional sports teams, running elite experiments and designing products for the peak potential community to help them reach their goals. And he's also been mostly, if not entirely, alcohol-free for the past two or three years. He is the founder and CEO of a company called Fount. Andrew Herr, great to have you with us, sir. James, great to be here. Um, yeah, really looking forward to chatting today. Thank you. When we say human performance, what are we actually referring to here? So I think of it two ways. You can split it sort of mental, physical, and then there's the physiological that relates maybe more to longevity and otherwise. Um, and then the last, the fourth thing I'll add is recovery. Um, and, and that really, I split them that way because as best I can tell, people want 10 things or one or more of those 10 things. They want to have better energy, mood, sleep, gut health, longevity, fertility, lose fat, gain muscle, stress management, kind of immunity, fertility, and maybe the longevity. And those are sort of like the, the world of things people want. And so I think about, great, those are your goals. If we take all your goals together, your goals, you know, there are plenty of things that will make you feel your mood really good for the next hour, but probably not going to be great for the long term. And so then we have to really rack and stack, you know, based on your goal set, what are the right tools? And when your clients come to you, I referenced the US military for seven years, are they looking for long term solutions? Or are they looking for short term peak performance habits that they can use in combat, for example? You know, we work with a broad range of people from, you know, executives and entrepreneurs to athletes to military to stay at home parents. And so the answer is um, the best people want a little bit of both, I think. And so what does that mean? You know, even if you're not in the military, there are people on the business side who want to be able to drop into deep work and really have one or two hours of really great deep work. But then also they probably have longer term goals as well. And if you're an elite military operator, not only do you need to be able to perform when you're on a mission, but if you're not recovering, then you're not going to be ready for the next one. You're going to get more likely to get injured. And so there's all these, I'd say the short and the long term, I, I like to think of them in concert. However, with the military, there's sort of no setup where the short term is prioritized more and it may be willing to risk long-term effects to achieve your mission in the short term. Um, and I have a tremendous respect for that, but also I wanna then make sure we can do everything we can to help people recover faster afterwards. Yeah, amazing. I'm particularly interested in getting into deep work for two hours injury prevention, because I'm going to be 50 years old next year, and I'm noticing a few little niggling injuries, uh, how to avoid jet lag. And if I get it, how to recover from it. And then longevity. I know a lot of our listeners are just trying to live the best life they can and maybe live as long as they can, but in a way that feels really healthy and energetic as opposed to, you know, I guess, slipping into the night with pains and aches and, and illness. Um, before I ask my personal questions, is there one particular human performance trait or tactic that you would put on the top of the tree of saying, you know what, if I was going to pass into the night and I could just put in one big lesson on a billboard and that was it, what might that be? My one big lesson is run your own experiments. Look, the thing that's gonna work best for me almost certainly won't work best for you and probably not for a third person. And so sure, you you know, there are plenty of smart influencers, scientists out there who say, hey, this is the best, you know, tool for sleep. And you know, some of those people aren't credible, but let's say they are credible. What they're saying is. When I look at studies that are the average of 50 or 100 people, the thing that worked best on average was X. But actually, it might be that Y worked a lot better for these 30 people 
and X were just kind of consistently mediocre, but because Y worked poorly or hurt the other people, like it balances out even or negative. So the answer is figure out your optimal, run N of one experiments, you know, we call them N of one, N is the number of people in an experiment. So N equals one means you're the only person in the experiment. And that is the, absolutely the most valuable lesson because if you just listen to other people, you're always gonna be, well, as I said, the average is always worse than the optimal. Yeah, I like to consider myself a mad scientist and I'm always running experiments. I'm willing to run experiments, get feedback, and then either abandon the experiment or continue on with it. An example of that, just for our listener anecdotally is, I ran the experiment of hiring a personal trainer in Medellin, Colombia, who charges five times less than what I might pay for a personal trainer in the US. For example, I pay $20 an hour and I take that personal trainer with me all over the world in the sense that if I'm in the UK and it's 12 p.m., well, that's only 6 a.m. in Medellin and he FaceTimes me or WhatsApp videos me and I put my earbuds in and I rest my phone against my water bottle and he just looks at me in whatever gym I'm in in the UK and tells me what to do and I do it. And I've been doing that and working with him five days a week for the past year. And that has just held me so incredibly accountable to actually just getting in the damn gym because I'm paying for it. I've got a set time where I have to be there. Whereas years before I had a personal trainer, sometimes I might skip a day. Sometimes I might turn up late. Sometimes I might just do it half-heartedly. That's an example of an experiment where people said, oh, but you don't want to take your phone into the gym. Oh, but then you've got to have your earbuds in and oh, it's going to be... I'm like, let me run the experiment. It worked out great. And I've been doing five personal one-on-one -on -one sessions a week for the past year. So is that kind of like an example of an sure. experiment, Andrew? I, it is. And I think it's actually a great example because most people think of an experiment as like, take this supplement versus that supplement, which can be a great experiment. But you're also experimenting what makes things work for you is extremely high value. You know, if you have been trying to work out more somebody not you but if somebody's been trying to work out more for years and they haven't succeeded somebody's trying to been improve their diet or lose weight for years and they can't do it then the block is almost certainly psychological and i would say working in the space and coaching for more than a decade now what's clear to me is that the people i work with i can very quickly get them up to speed on what they should be doing or what what the next experiment is what's likely to help them but if they can't do it, then there's a psychological block. Hey, is food serving an emotional need for you? Is it comfort? Are you using it to handle stress? And then, hey, it's almost like saying stop eating that is the equivalent of like stop, you know, handling your stress well. Yes. And obviously a person just can't do that. Is there an anecdotal example that you have in your own life, Andrew, where you struggled with something for years and then made what in hindsight was a very simple shift, possibly from an experiment like we're talking about, which then had a dramatic effect on your health or your performance? Yeah, I mean, so I'll give my version of your example, uh, which is to say, um, my issue wasn't needing to prioritize working out, but prioritizing recovery. Um, but and like, and what I learned is like, that wasn't just resting, I needed to be doing active recovery, I needed to be increasing flexibility, other things. And so I work with a chiropractor, Chinese medicine doctor twice a week now. And that's what we focus on. And occasionally we'll do some lifting stuff and, and heavier stuff when we're together. But not only does it make sure I'm prioritizing those things, but I'm there every Monday and Friday. So if on a Thursday, I tweak something in the gym, we're treating it Friday. Like it's scheduled already. If I tweak some, like the worst possible scenario is I tweak something on a Tuesday and I'm not there till Friday. Um, and this dovetails with the fact that there are very few injuries short of a broken bone or something torn where waiting and totally resting it is the best solution. And that's not something that is generally taught. I was always told, you know, rest, ice, recovery, and like essentially almost none of those things are the right solution, the right kind of movement. Now there's the wrong kind of movement that can absolutely hurt. I'm not saying just keep pushing it if it's injured, but the right kind of movement don't ice it probably is actually the answer. And like, there's a bunch of things that are the opposite of what we were taught. And so 
you know, I've had to learn, relearn in a sense over the years. So that's an example of something where I was like, let me test this. And it's been a home run for my health because I'm always pushing my body and recovery projects forward. And I'm always recovering faster from injuries if I get them. Um, so yeah, so, and then, you know, I'm right now I've been testing a full stop of all my supplements. So I've taken a, a supplement protocol. I've made several major changes over the last six months that have been honestly, have been feeling great. And, but I was like, you know what? I have an opportunity here where I'm going to do a total stop and then rebuild it. And I got to tell you, my inflammation has been through the roof. I felt terrible. And you know what? Like, I'm not saying I'm enjoying that, but it's been extremely valuable to see. And now I get to add back and make sure all the things I was taking are still relevant, but man, like good to know I was on roughly the right track there. So you were taking what most people would say was something that was going to serve you health wise supplements as you were taking a series of different supplements and you, it had an adverse effect. No, no, no. The opposite. I stopped my supplements to test. Are they helping me? Cause I've been taking them for a while. And when I stopped, lo and behold, man, did I feel worse? And I was like, uh, okay, good to know. It. So and supplements I, actually worked go. for you. Yeah. Got it. But, but I let it go. I let it go for uh, two full weeks because, Hey, maybe it feel bad for a couple of days and then you get better, but like pretty consistently for a couple of weeks, I, my performance has been lower and a couple of those injuries I have have popped back, not heavy, but like I can feel where they were. I can just sense the inflammation. And so great. Now I'm going to go back on it and I'll add them back slowly to see what was playing the biggest role. And if I need all of them, but you know, again, every once in a while, it's great to test. Is this still serving me? Mm. May I share a couple of experiments that I ran recently and the results that I got from it? Uh, I'm based mostly in Medellin, Colombia, and the country of Colombia has uh, mostly, if not all, grass-fed beef, as opposed to most beef that's sold uh, to consumers in the U.S., which would be grain-fed, right? There's a big difference between a grass-fed cow and a grain-fed cow. Do you want to just, before I share my anecdote, do you want to just share what you know to be the difference between a grass-fed cow and a grain-fed cow? Yeah, so there's a couple different variations you'll get. Sometimes you'll get grass-fed grain finished, meaning when they fatten them up in the feed lot where they're feeding them there, there could be 100% grass-fed, which is, again, grass-fed all the way through. Um, or you can have grain-fed most of the way through. But um, for the most part, most cattle in the U.S. are eating grass for a lot of their life, and then they're being finished, fattened up in a feed lot on corn, mostly corn and soy. And what happens is, they add a lot of intramuscular fat. And that's, you know, when you get a steak and it has that white marbling in it, that's fat infiltrating the muscle. If you see that in a human body, that's a very bad thing. That's a sign of metabolic disturbance to the max. That's a sign of inflammation and other things. Um, but it makes meat more tender and it makes it taste good because fat tastes good. However, it also adds a tremendous amount of both saturated fat and omega-6 fatty acids because these, um, well, it adds a tremendous amount of fat to the meat, I should say. Um, it may not actually be adding omega-6 even though they're eating it, but I, it's, I'm just gonna tell, that's, that's what we know. And then I'm gonna add my hypothesis that is, I don't know for sure, but I believe that it's because of all that inflammation being caused in the, in the cow's body that the meat is somehow picking up some of that inflammation and it's affecting us when we eat. And I don't think we know the mechanism for that. I'm just telling you that based on the patterns I see in people, I think that's what's going on. Yeah. The nutritional benefits that you get from eating a corn or soy fed cow is vastly inferior to the nutritional benefits you get from eating a grass fed cow. Yes. Basically, the grass has all these polyphenols and all the other compounds in it that are really quite devoid in the kernel. It's like, you know, grass is typically relatively green. And then, you know, the corn or soy is that like, you know, like corn at least is that quite yellow color. So I think the answer is you're getting a lot more fat and potentially less other nutrients. Um, and especially, you know, depending on what you're getting, 
you can get grass-fed beef that's fed in a feed lot or you can get grass-fed beef that's pasture raised also and so there's all these variations obviously but um i think there's it's very likely that for most people grass-fed beef is a better option yes and segueing back to the experiment that i ran uh I ate a four. I ate four hundred and fifty grams of pasture-raised, grass-fed beef four times a week for about four straight months while I was in Medellin, Colombia, for four straight months. So I got that's one this. one pound for the for all the Americans listening and Brits. That's one pound every essentially every day. And. Uh, you know, and in addition, I ate pasture-raised eggs. So pasture-raised eggs come from hens that ate worms in the ground, as opposed to being fed soy, corn, wheat, all that kind of stuff. Now, supermarkets try to trick us, is, is what I would submit, because they say cage-free eggs and organic eggs. But neither of that could mean that they're pasture raised eggs. That could just mean, well, they had a whole lot of hens, they put them in some cages and they left the cage doors open and they were free to roam if they chose, but we didn't put them out on grass. We actually fed them a whole lot of corn and a whole lot of wheat. Now, hens don't want to eat that naturally. They want to go and peck in the ground and eat bugs and worms and all of those kind of things. So when you crack open a pasture raised egg, the yolk is bright orange. If you crack open anything that's not a pasture-raised egg, it's much more a yellow type color. Now, what we want in terms of the nutritional value, at least that's this is my understanding, and you can correct me or amend me if I'm uh, if I'm mistaken, Andrew, is the orange yolk from the pasture-raised egg because the nutritional benefits of that is vastly superior to anything else. Is that your understanding as well? Yeah, so I mean, what's amazing, you can actually show there, there's been some farms that do it and experiments where if they feed um, these hens like things with a lot of red color, like red peppers, things like that, you can make a nearly red yolk, which is to say that the thing the bird eats is getting into the egg, no surprise, and not just the macronutrients, proteins, and other things, but these micronutrients, these carotenoids, and other um, tertiary metabolic compounds from plants. So um, there are some farms that are starting to cheat by feeding things that are more red, but if it's naturally that way, I agree, it's likely to have a more nutrient dense diet. The only thing I'd say differently is I totally agree. That that's what hens naturally eat in the environment, but they love eating corn and soy. They like, just like people love nothing more than sitting at home and eating sugar and, and stuff like that. So they love eating it, but it doesn't mean it's good for us. No. So just to wrap up my experiment, I ate mostly 450 gram super punta anchor cuts of beef uh, four times a week. And then almost every day I had probably four or five pasture raised eggs. And then I would snack on 450 gram tubs of zero fat Greek yogurt. Okay. Uh, and I would put some blueberries in there. And Greek yogurt has, is very high in protein and very low in calories, especially the, the, the less fat that it has in it. And I was choosing 0% fat Greek yogurt. And just to put this in perspective, 450 grams in a tub is a big, 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 big tub. And it only had about 350 calories in that whole 450 gram tub. So very low in the caloric intake very high in the protein and then i was adding these blueberries which are very low in the glycemic index have lots of great nutritional benefits for you and for the most part four or five days a week that's what i was eating right and then on the other days i ate some crappy food and i ate some chips and i had some chicken and whatever right i did i got my blood work tested six weeks ago my testosterone levels went from when I last had them tested about a year ago from the 400s, which is modest. It's kind of on the lower end of what a man in his late 40s probably wants to have to over 1,000, over 1,000. I mean, that is extraordinary. If you're, if you're a man and you have a testosterone level over 1,000, that's very, very, very high. Now, to be clear, 
my cholesterol level did go up, did, did increase. But when you tested the good cholesterol to the bad cholesterol, the ratio was actually incredibly healthy. So that's an example, I think, of what you're what you do and what you, you know, I, I guess have clients for is in terms of human performances. I ran an experiment. I was only subjected to grass-fed beef. I intentionally ate pasture-raised eggs. I intentionally ate, you know, low caloric, low fat Greek yogurt. And the result was an, almost a three times my testosterone levels. Look, and for somebody else, maybe that wouldn't work as well, but that's a home run. Like, you know, for somebody your age, a thousand testosterone level is elite. I mean, that the, the first thing I'd see when, if I saw a set of labs for a client, and I saw a thousand testosterone at your age, I'm going to scan down to see if the other markers suggest you're juicing, right? Are you pinning testosterone? Mm. Um, and if you're not, that's fantastic. You know, and then again, is there a trade-off there with cholesterol and heart disease risk? That depends on what the rest of your labs look like. And so again, finding what works for you is fantastic. And I love that this experiment seems to have been like quite a home run for you. Yes. And just so I'm not uh, portraying a... Uh mistaken but belief that i'm a superhuman i am prone i have been prone to gout attacks my body has very high uric acid which can trigger gout attacks but interestingly i didn't have a gout attack during this experiment of eating lots of meat and and traditionally the more eat meat you eat people say the higher the uric acid the more likely you are to get a gout attack if you experience gout attacks but i didn't experience a gout attack from that ironically when i got the, the most number of gout attacks was when I was living with a former partner and she was a vegan and she was cooking us a lot of lentils and beans. And I had three gout attacks in one year. And I went back and researched afterwards and realized that there's just a tremendous amount of purines in lentils and beans, which um, raises uric acid, which can trigger a gout attack. Um, and the other thing is like, what it sounds like is this diet seems to be anti-inflammatory for you. And gout absolutely is the buildup of uric acid and crystals in your joints and that causes pain and inflammation, but there seems to be an inflammatory component. And then two, it seems like for the most part, you're eating ultra low carb for most of the days a week. And there may be some influence as well with uric acid of um, certain carbohydrates, especially fructose. And so it sounds like maybe also all these things together were helping you contribute to clearing it properly, which is fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. I don't want to monopolize the the our conversation here with anecdotal stories of, about me, but I just I actually just want to add one more because I think it's <laughs> relevant to the conversation, and then I I want to segue that into sleep, and that is, I own a company called Swanick Sleep, and we produce blue light blocking glasses, and uh, the University of Washington conducted a scientific study on our glasses in 2018, which showed that people who wear the orange lensed blue light blockers from our company in the last hour before they go to sleep, they self-reported that they slept 11% better and they their productivity anecdotally, they submitted um, the following day increased by about 12%. Now, the, the reason that, that I mentioned that and how that company even came to be was from running what you just talked about, which is running an experiment. And that was all the way back in 2015, a friend of mine told me about the power of blocking blue light with an orange lens. And so I went back to my apartment in West Hollywood, California, where I was living at the time. And I dug out an old pair of orange lens ski goggles. Yeah. And I put these damn ski goggles on while I was watching reruns of the AMC TV series, Mad Men. <laughs> and what I noticed over the course of this one week experiment is that while I was, you know, looking ridiculous watching this TV show through these ski goggles, I did notice that I started to feel uh, more tired wearing the goggles. And when I removed them, turned the light off and then rolled over and, and went to sleep, I noticed that I fell asleep quicker, I slept deeper, and I woke up feeling noticeably refreshed. And then based on that experiment, I then went on to produce these, um, I guess you could say stylish pair, pair of blue blockers, which have now which I wear religiously every night. It helps me sleep. And now it's helped hundreds of thousands of customers over the years, helping them sleep as well. So again, I'll, I'll turn it back onto you now because I've hogged the, the limelight too much. But again, that's just an example of running an experiment 
and then seeing this tremendous impact that experiment can have on the person running the experiment, but then after that, hundreds of thousands of people. And, you know, that's really what we, we're in the same mode at Fount. Basically, we work with individuals, mostly entrepreneurs, executives, high performers, athletes, and we run end of one coaching. So I'll give you, you know, we give people a coach that will help design these experiments and run them and track the results. And, you know, we run our own custom supplement facility outside of LA and so we ship you everything. We want to make your life easy and fun. But when we discover things that work for a lot of people or that we can algorithmically target, we turn them into products so that other people can have access. And so you mentioned jet lag. Um, we can send algorithmically customized each person and now send more than 90% of people anywhere in the world with minimal to no jet lag. That's incredible. Let's dig into that, Andrew. You have become known as one of the world's top jet lag, jet lag experts, and you've developed a a product to help people with that. Now, so how does one avoid jet lag? And then the second part of my question will be, if you've got jet lag, how do you overcome that? 100%. So what's really novel about what we do is, um, based on work I was doing with Navy SEALs and fighter pilots, we discovered that the pressure changes in flight and the low oxygen environment cause an inflammatory response. So if you think about how you just feel when you fly normally, probably don't feel as good when you get off a plane normally. Maybe your gut's a little more off, you're more tired, brain fog, joints don't feel as good. Uh, it varies by person. But when, you, especially when you take these long flights, you get this quite strong inflammatory response. And that actually is a big part of the reason you can't shift your circadian rhythm. So what we figured out how to do was um, build an algorithm that can tell you when to take specific supplements that can prevent the inflammation from starting and then tamp down whatever keeps going. And then combine supplements, meal timing, sleep timing, insulin signaling, all these factors together to shift your circadian rhythm really quickly. And because you don't have that inflammatory overlay, we can shift your circadian rhythm and expect you to sleep well your first night in Tokyo, Sydney, Dublin, uh, wherever you're going, really anywhere in the world. So how does that look practically? What do what does one take? What does one, you know, and how long before the flight? What do they do during the flight? What do they do when they get off the flight? Yeah, so, you know, my goal when designing that product is like, it can't tell you to start three days before. Like people are busy, they've got things going on. Like they just can't, they just don't want to or can't afford to do it days before. So we've been able to get the protocol down to, you know, put everything, you put your flights and answer a few simple questions in an app, in our app. The app then gives you a custom program, starts the morning you leave. It tells you, hey, here's your optimal time to wake up. And then it'll tell you when to eat, sleep and use different supplements in the kit to make life easy. The supplements come in blister packs. You can just like pop them out when you're on a plane. There's not a bottle to carry. Um, and you're just sort of walked through, hey, take two of the red pills and one of the gold pills right now. And in six hours, it'll tell you to do the next thing. Um, and then we also incorporate blue light blocking glasses. Um, to your point, can be very effective at helping manage circadian rhythm. And the other piece that I think we've really brought to the fore is insulin helps reset your circadian rhythm peripherally. So obviously we think a lot about your central or your brain circadian rhythm with sleep, but your gut, and your liver and your, your adrenals, these other organs have circadian rhythms as well. And insulin is one of the hormones that helps reset that, which may be why it's kind of a challenge when people eat really late and kind of mess up their sleep. And so we figured out how to cause a temporary insulin increase um, at the right time to get your body kind of to peripherally reset and then stop the negative effects of that with the supplements after it. Um, and so this is sort of the point of like, we to do this at you know 90 plus percent of people going to Asia or Europe and, and sleeping well, it's gotta be a really integrated program. And the only way to make that easy, if an app is just telling you like, hey, do X, do Y, do Z with a notification each time. What's the name of your jet lag prevention product? So the product's called Flykit, F-O-Y-K-I-T-T, -T, two T's. Um, and uh, yeah, we sell it you know, on our website, fount.bio, F-O-U-N-T.bio, or at flykit.com. And 
excited to be uh, announcing two new Olympic team partnerships coming up soon. Uh, we just launched a new partnership with Yotel, the hotel brand. Um, so really excited to be getting um, that product out there used by uh, more than a dozen pro and Olympic teams at this point. Wonderful. I am going to try your fly kit on an upcoming flight from Bogota, Colombia to London, England, which is coming up uh, in about six weeks from now. So I'm going to get my hands on one of your fly kits and I'm going to go through the app. And I, it seems like that's what I do, right? I, I punch my uh, flight details into an app and then it tells me what I'll need to do. And then you send me out the yeah, relevant- we ships you a physical kit. It's like about the size of a first class amenity kit. So it slips right into a backpack or anything and mm -hmm. it has everything you need in it. Um, supplements, glasses, although I'm sure you've got a great pair of Swannies already to throw mm. in there. Um, and the app will walk you through every step and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it should be a great experience. Yeah. Amazing. Is there something that you see folks doing incorrectly on overnight flights, red eye flights, for example, irrespective of whether they've got the fly kit or not, what do people do that is actually contributing even more to their jet lag. Yeah, so there's a couple things. The most surprising one I find is that, you know, everyone's heard the recommendation, get light at day, during daytime at your destination. But there's actually a three hour period on some trips where you don't want light during day at your destination because your brain is still responding to signals from your home time zone. And so that's why, you know, we like the app being able to give you recommendations because there can be these totally counterintuitive things. Um, the, I think most of the other general recommendations are pretty good. Although one thing that we do differently, there's a lot of recommendations out there to fast when you're flying for jet lag and fasting can help people because it tends to reduce inflammation. But when, when we can handle the inflammation with our supplement protocol, then we're also, instead of fasting, we're going to have you eat. So you're feeding your brain and it's sort of the best of both worlds. Cause the only issue with fasting is it can raise stress hormone levels and deprive your brain of nutrients a bit when you're stressed and traveling. So, um, I think the light thing at very specific times, uh, is, is interesting. And I think the other thing people do that they kind of know probably isn't a good idea. Uh, is drinking on planes. So alcohol on planes is sort of a double whammy. Alcohol increases your sympathetic tone. So it increases sort of the adrenaline signaling in your body. And the result of that is, even if it helps you fall asleep, sleep is lower quality on average. And then that higher adrenaline stress hormone levels can drive inflammation. And now if you have inflammation from the flying plus inflammation from the alcohol, that can be a double whammy that really hits you the next couple of days. So we fly kit helps regardless of whether you drink or not, but we do recommend that you not drink on planes. Well, I might go a step further and say, I just recommend you don't drink, but then I'm biased because I have a company called alcohol free lifestyle and this is the alcohol free lifestyle podcast. <laughs> yes. No, I mentioned that not, not just because of this, but you know, What's interesting is if we think about the this sort of N and one experiment concept I've shared, mm. it's to say that everyone's different. Yes. What we know is that almost everyone's sleep is disrupted by alcohol, some more than others, and some it requires more than others. But I've ran the experiment with myself. And you know what? Even one drink reduces my energy, my mood, everything the next day so much that I just don't want to. Like I, I don't have a hard rule where I couldn't drink. I had a sip of wine for the first time in years the other day. Like I don't have a hard rule. I, re I regret it. I just didn't feel as good afterwards. So I don't, um, I don't have a hard rule, but I just essentially haven't found the situation where I want to anymore. Mm. Let's move the conversation, if I may, from jet lag to longevity what are some experiments that you've run either on yourself or with your military clients or any clients you know whether they're olympians or uh, executives or entrepreneurs in terms of longevity and, and maybe just before you answer that let's define what we think the word longevity means 
you know, I think longevity has taken on the new connotation of health span plus lifespan. You know, people want to live longer, but they want to live better longer too. So, you know, I think often we're talking about both those things instead of just technically meaning like how long till you, your heart totally flatlines. Um, so I think, you know, what people really want is I want to feel good, perform well, think sharply into my eighties, nineties, even, or beyond. And so, you know, I would say most elite athletes or elite military are not thinking about longevity. They might want to play longer, but they're not thinking about, they're mostly focused on performing as well now. Um, and so I'm never going to tell somebody what their goal is. I'm going to try to help them reach their goals. And I may, you know, try to align things for the short and long term. but for executives, longevity has absolutely become a much bigger goal set. And I think the, the keys to longevity seem to be, um, managing inflammation, managing stress hormone levels, and managing metabolism. Those seem to be the most important three pieces of the puzzle. Got Maybe it. with the say, fourth being with the fourth being managing your physical body as well. So you said inflammation, stress, hormones, and inflammation, stress, metabolism. Our metabolism, yep. And managing your physical body. Got it. Um, okay. And, and so, so that's, you said that they're the form things that are most important for the demographic of high performing executives or entrepreneurs. Is that what you This referring? is, this is, these are sort of the pillars of longevity. Okay. Got it. And so for each of those, there can be great experiments to run. So let's take inflammation. If somebody we think has inflammation either coming from their gut or systemically, variety of things we may try are. You know, we use a variety of these polyphenol class supplements. These are fruit and vegetable extracts that can be potently anti-inflammatory. Um, you know, I, I think sauna is totally underrated. If we look at the health interventions that have the most evidence behind them, diet, exercise, sleep, and then sauna could be fourth. Like mm. it's remarkably well supported. Um, so uh, changes in diet, that might be cutting down carbohydrates for one person. It might be changing fat composition for a second person. So again, let's run these experiments. And so how are we going to test inflammation? Well, if you have true high-grade systemic inflammation, we might use a blood marker like C-reactive protein. But if it's more subtle in gut, then we might look at how do you feel? How are your energy levels? How's your sleep after we run that experiment? And we can sort of extrapolate from there to what inflammation might be in your gut or, or systemically. For stress, I might want to use a wearable tracker that can give me heart rate variability when you sleep. Heart rate variability is the amount of variability between in the gap between your heartbeats. You might, you know, a lot of people think that their heartbeat is a perfect metronome. It's like kind of perfect in rhythm, but there's quite a bit of variability between the beats. And the more there is, uh, it's a sign that there's less stress in the system. If you get stressed, your heart becomes much more regular and your heart rate variability goes down. So you want a high heart rate variability and we can run tests on things like meditation, breath work, supplements like L-theanine or ashwagandha. We can use these supplements and protocols to test um, how it affects your heart rate variability. Uh, for your body, this is testing different protocols for strength and flexibility, you know, do you work better in a low rep range? Are you, are, do you gain more muscle and more strength in a six to eight rep range or a 10 to 12, or even a 16 to 20 rep range, lower weight, higher reps? There's gonna be inner individual variability there. Um, and so these are the kinds of experiments we like to run. And it's really a question of like, where's your biggest deficit? You know, if, you're, if you have a lot of injuries, then we need to potentially lower inflammation and we need to strengthen your body. If your body feels great, but you're really stressed, let's start there. And so the answer is like, let's start wherever is most important for your specific case to reach your specific goals. You know, I ran an experiment two days ago of going to a dermatologist because I have a bald head and I grew up in the Australian sun and the Australian sun is renowned for being particularly strong because there's a big hole in the ozone layer, stronger than say, if you grew up in the Northern hemisphere. And uh, 
I kind of wish I didn't run the experiment or rather I, I'm glad I ran the experiment because what it revealed is something that I need to take care of, but I don't want to take care of. And that is that uh, I was told that I have something called actinic keratoses and they are precancerous legions, which it's effectively they're an alert that the skin has been compromised. There's a lot of DNA damage because of the sun. And when there's many, it's called field cancerization. And so I have field cancerization, I'm told by my dermatologist. And her suggestion was I use this drug called uh, Edifex, which is a kind of like a chemo cream that you rub on your face. And what I can expect is that my face will go incredibly red and scab, and it will kill all of those lesions of cancer. So, um, oh, and I should say, I don't have cancer, but what I have is precancerous cells which could turn into cancer later on. So um, all of that is to say that sometimes you don't get the results that you really want when you go and run these experiments, right? But it's important that you do, Andrew. Yeah, look, I just went and got a full body MRI. And what would like the worst result from that be? Probably a cancer. But like, if I have a cancer, I want to know because I'm going to go kill it. I'm going to go figure out how to kill it. <laughs> So yeah, you might get, you might get hard news. I mean, we get lab results back for people that are like, Hey, like, I know you feel like you're in good shape, but like your body's starting to break down from all the stress, you know, for executives, for example, that can be a, something we see, but like the good news is, but there's things we can do about it. And as long as you give yourself that agency, then I want to know everything about my body. Um, my, my dad's a physician, a doctor, and he likes to joke that I love tests, like more blood tests, more MRI, or whatever. I love it. And he's right because like that data to me is useful either today or it's a baseline for the future. I love knowing more. And even if there's nothing I can do about it, then the key is, hey, make sure you don't let your brain kind of run with this and get scared or worried. Because if you scan, if you do an MRI of the spine of 100 people with no back pain, a huge number of them are going to have herniated discs, stenosis here, and they could absolutely psych themselves into a ton of pain. But like the key is use the data where it's useful and don't let it sort of control you. You mentioned wearables before to track and to create data. I wear an aura ring. So I track my sleep and my heart rate variability, which is what you just referenced, my resting heart rate. I track how many steps I do a day. I'm always striving to get at least 10,000. Rarely do I get less than 10,000, but that's what I strive to get. Are there any other trackables or wearables that you would recommend our listeners consider? Yeah, I like Aura. I think Whoop is another good one. You know, it's a strap around your wrist instead of a ring on your finger. There's, I think they're roughly comparable. It's sort of like a preference thing. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that's gotten hot in the last few years that's sort of a wearable is a continuous glucose monitor. So here you're going to put something on the back of your arm, typically. It's going to have a micro needle that goes to the skin and samples your um, interstitial fluid for glucose or blood sugar levels throughout the day continuously. And you can start to see, hey, what's my metabolic health in real time? How does this kind of food affect it? How does that kind of food? And you get people finding things that they're quite surprised by. Oatmeal spikes my blood sugar to the moon. I thought oatmeal was healthy. Well, for you, it might not be. Um, and it might be fine for somebody else. Um, hey, this fruit or this food I thought was healthy. Um, and if something's really spiking your blood sugar high, it's probably a good sign that it's not great for you and other meals you might find, Hey, this works great. And so, um, I think there can be, there are not only unhappy conclusions from it. Um, I would say on average, the happiest conclusion is that ice cream tends to be a dessert that doesn't spike your blood sugar as much, but mm -hmm. it still has a lot of calories. So if you're trying to lose fat, that might not be great, but all that to say, I think uh, blood, I think CGMs, in addition to the other trackers, are probably some of the other most valuable wearables to be continuous glucose monitors. Do you know, I don't think I've eaten ice cream in the four or five months since I discovered zero fat Greek yogurt. That's fascinating because Greek yogurt has practically no sugar yep. where and 350 calories and 450 grams. I mean, it takes me 20 minutes to eat this 
Greek yogurt tub with and the blueberries. You're blue getting berries. a massive amount of protein. You must be getting eight, 70, 80 grams of protein in that. In a 450 grams, it's not that many grams of protein. It's it's about 35 grams of protein. Uh, if it's 350 calories and 35 grams of protein, I think I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest we go back to the label on that one. Yeah, let's do it. I'm gonna pull it up as we're talking here, and I'll ask you another question while I'm pulling it up. Um, what are the most common simple mistakes you see your clients making as it relates to either food, sleep, or recovery? I think a big one is timing. So. What does that mean? I'm thinking of a former pro athlete client, incredibly smart guy, doing some cold plunge, really likes it, gives him more energy, focuses his brain, but he was doing it right after lifting. And when you cold plunge right after you lift, you lose like maybe half the value of your workout because the cold shuts down the inflammatory signaling that is required for muscle adaptation. Um, we have a lot of people who come in and are taking a multivitamin in the morning. If that multivitamin has vitamin C and E, it's blocking and you work out in the morning, it's blocking uh, the workout signaling from the inside, not with cold, losing 50% of the value of your workout. Uh, food timing, I think most people do well by eating earlier than they are. If you eat within three, some people even four hours of sleep, it can decrease sleep quality pretty meaningfully. Um, temperature, if you're not sleep, if you haven't tested sleeping colder, you may be leaving a lot of potential benefit on the table, um, lowering the thermostat and potentially trying out one of these bed cooling systems like eight sleep or Uller um, can be very high value. So those are just a few of the things that I'd say are um, things we look at right away. And then if you can stop looking at your phone, the first thing when you wake up, that can be a huge thing. Five minutes of meditation or waiting till after you eat a little bit, or even just brush your teeth, giving your prefrontal cortex, that higher thinking part of your brain time to come online before stressful stuff comes in and lights up all those like deeper emotional centers, of your brain can also just set you up for a much less stressful day. Yeah. Uh, I found a brand of Greek yogurt here while you were talking here, uh, which is one, which is a brand that I eat. However, it's not the, the size that I eat. It's a little bit bigger, but let me show you this. I'll just share my screen and we'll walk through this just for fun. Uh, let me share my screen for you. Can you see this breakdown? So this is a 550 gram tub of Greek yogurt. Okay. Now you can see here, it says uh, per uh, 100 gram portion, right? And you go down. Well, actually, let's go um, per 100 grams. So if we go down into the protein, it says seven and a half grams, right? So if we times that by five, that's 35 to 40 grams of protein. Do you see yeah, that? Yeah, what I was what I was reacting to, see, this has fat in it. So that's mm -hmm. going to change the calories. Uh, maybe yeah, I this isn't a, you, this but... isn't a purely zero percent fat. I couldn't find the zero percent fat one that I ate, so this has got a little bit of fat in it, just for clarity. Okay, but I I thought you'd said three hundred and fifty calories because if there's only forty grams of protein, that's one hundred and sixty calories. The other um, hundred and ninety calories have to come from somewhere else, and mm -hmm. so there's not that much carbohydrate in there. So I think um, I think what's the case is actually it has le even less calories than you were saying. Yeah. It's fascinating. I mean, it's uh, six times five is 30. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it, that's exactly right. It's, it's, it's incredibly low calories. Yeah. Cause and if we then... look at here per hundred gram portion mm -hmm. or yeah, calories. Yeah. Per hundred grams, four and a half times 67. So that's 240, 28, 268 um, plus 33. Yeah. Um, yeah. 290 301 yeah oh, just like lower. i said just like i said like 300 yeah below and this is and by the way this is with fat in it which means it has an extra almost 50 calories of that as fat so if it didn't have fat it would be mm. even probably like 250 i don't understand why more people aren't talking about greek yogurt it's a superfood in my view and it and it's not just because i'm eating a lot of it it's because i'm not eating the ice cream that I used to be eating. And it's not to say that I was eating ice cream every night, but I might've eaten it once or twice a week. 
but now it's that's just been eliminated i mean how that can make a huge difference to somebody's body composition their quality of sleep their self confidence when you multiply that over a year right yeah it can i mean like i just pulled up on my sides if you are getting 350 calories worth of zero fat greek yogurt that's about 60 grams of protein from a zero fat one so 350 calories 60 grams of protein um which is like a tremendous amount of protein most people aren't getting optimal protein levels to begin with and so yeah. now you're solving two problems cutting calories and adding uh protein can be a big win what are the potential drawbacks if you're sensitive to dairy it can be an issue but if you're not sensitive to dairy then no problem mm. um and some people have a harder time with the sour flavor of it and but you know the funny thing is if you want to make that whole greek yogurt sweet you'd have to put a lot of sugar in it but mm. if you want to put a drizzle of honey on the top you could put a very small amount it's not going to make the whole thing sweet, but the first thing your tongue touches might be sweet and then mm. it'll mix in. And so you can actually do things like that that allow you to get some of the sweetness if you need it. If you don't need it, then even mm. better in a sense. But if you need it, can give you some of the sweetness um, with it, like way less sugar. Because if you look at um, truly sweetened Greek yogurt, it's going to have a lot of sugar in it. Mm. Or you could just do what I tend to do, which is put put in some blueberries, you know, which is sweet. And then you can, you know, it, but yeah, you're right. Just a little drizzle of, of honey can like make that just be so delicious. So whereas uh, I just pulled up a Greek yogurt on my side, that's one of the sweetened ones and it's sweetened with honey and it's one of the kind of nicer, high quality ones, mm. but per serving, which is much less than you eat, they're adding 15 grams of sugar to that 350 gram version. They'd be adding 30 grams of sugar. And suddenly mm. that's a very different nutritional composition. Yes. Even more incentive to track and read thoroughly the labels of the food that you are purchasing. So yeah. I love it. Yeah. All right. Well, Andrew Herr, the founder of Fount, human performance expert. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. We covered a lot. We covered jet lag. Uh, if you're a listener here and you know that you've got jet lag potentially in your future, I would encourage you to go to flykit.com. Kit has two Ts, or you can go to fount.bio or io. Is that bio. right? Bio. B-I-O. B-I-O, yeah. Fount.bio.com and check out some of Andrew's uh, products. We talked about the Aura Ring, the Whoop, talked about the benefit of saunas, uh, heart rate variability, blue blocking glasses, making sure we sleep really well. Uh, Andrew shared his repair uh, technique of having the accountability of going and seeing his, uh, I guess you'd say, Eastern medicine expert. He's also a chiropractor. So he's he's bringing a lot of things to the table, which I, is one of the things I like about him. I talked about uh, having a virtual personal trainer and taking him or her with you all over the world. Basically, you've got a personal trainer in your pocket and that can be very cost effective. We talked about why you should not drink alcohol on a flight, if at all. And uh, I'm sure we covered lots of other things, which I can't recall here in this summary, but this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Andrew. I appreciate you sharing your guidance with us. James, such a pleasure. Thanks for having me.